All right, well, my name is uh, Stuart Bruce. I'm with the Center for Environment and Society, the GIS program, and uh, happy to be here today. Uh, my goal today is to give a um, global overview of grant writing. And then the next four sessions, we're going to drill in to some of the specifics about what I'm talking to today. But if for some reason this is the only session you attend, you're going to get a full snapshot today, OK? Um, but I encourage you to attend all the other sessions. And the goal, uh, as I stated in the uh, document, the goal at the end of this course, because this course is graded, OK? You're going to get a grade. You're either going to pass or you're going to fail. And the way that's going to happen is I want all of you to write a grant. And with my help and a lot of help from Bonnie, OK? And we actually have another person that's going to be helping us out, Samantha Dorm. You're going to submit the grant. And your grade will be determined by the funding agency that you submit it to. Pass or fail, OK? Now, I start off uh, my presentation. I've done this actual workshop before uh, when I was at Penn State. I used to roam around Pennsylvania doing all kinds of things. And this is one of them, because people need money to do things. Budgets are tight uh, and so forth. But I start off with the concerns. And one of the big concerns I hear from people, does everybody here have a job right now? Two jobs? For you students, are you kind of busy? You got classwork, frat parties, I mean, uh, you know, more classwork, study, and things like that. So a lot of you are probably wondering, you know, how do you find the time to do an extra project? Because writing a grant is an extra project. And uh, I have a simple answer for that. You're going to work harder, OK, um, if you're serious about trying to get a grant. Most of my grants are written uh, and polished off between the hours of 9 PM and 1 AM, OK? Um, for those of you that know me, um, you, you know that. So you really have to carve the time out. So the question is, are you serious about getting a grant? And if you are, then you should be willing to spend the time necessary, because um, it is extra work. Paperwork and reporting, I hear a lot of people uh, talk about that. Um, it's true, and John mentioned it a little bit. Certain grants have a lot of paperwork. Um, some days I feel like I'm turning into a paper-pushing bureaucrat, OK? Um, but it comes with the territory, OK? You've got to make sure that whoever gives you money, that you satisfy their requirements. If for no other reason, what's the main reason you'd want to do that? You want to ask them again, OK? Mm -hmm. And people that give money don't like to give money a second time to someone who <laughs> cannot follow their simple procedures. Um, if you're lucky, you have some support. Like, I'm fortunate. I have LaSara helping me, and Erica helping me, and Mia helping me, and Andrew helping me uh, with the reporting requirements. So you can get people to help you. Who will handle the money? Now, for those of you at Washington College, this is a very simple answer. It's called the business office will handle the money, OK? Uh, Debbie Gannon at the business office, who's not here today, is an absolute resource for us at the college. Uh, and she helps make sure that all the paperwork and the budgets are there, because our grants get audited. And uh, again, if you fail an audit and you can't handle the money, you will never get money again, OK? I know you're from an outside organization. I'm not sure who handles your budget, um, but someone's got to be you know, sharp at that uh, to make sure that you document everything. Project evaluations, uh, this is an important thing. We actually have a speaker, Lisa Cohn, who will be here on October 24th. Uh, her company, uh, Smart Tech Educational Consulting Services, um, that's what she does is project evaluations. And uh, my solution to that was I've contracted with Lisa OK, to assist me with the project evaluation part. So that's how I kind of get around that. Um, I bring someone in to help me. And you can do the same thing, too, uh, if you have a strong evaluation requirement. So some more concerns. Uh, this is a really big one. A lot of grants require match money. My favorite grant, therefore, is the no match required. OK, so when I see that on a grant proposal, no match money required, I go, woohoo. You know, it's a, it's a really, it's a great thing, okay? 
Sometimes you can use what's called in-kind staff support. We do that a lot of grants. So I'll say, hey, I'm going to work on this grant. Um, so my time is worth X amount per hour. And I start adding up how many hours that is. If, you have a, if you're a smaller organization, you might have volunteer time. So I might say, hey, all the students that work for me are going to volunteer one hour a week. And I start adding that up, and I have in-kind staff support. You do have to document it and everything like that, but uh, a lot of grants you can do that. Hard cash. Yuck. Okay. I mean, you're going out looking for money. Someone wants to give you $50,000, but in order to do that, you have to come up with fifty grand yourself. Those are really tough to do. And uh, there's some grants that I would like to go after that I just don't have an extra $50,000 in cold, hard cash lying around. So I go, shucks, so much for that grant. Another thing that I do, and this is, uh, it can be a little tricky, but it has to be done correctly. But sometimes you can use, let's say you get a state grant, you can use the state grant as match for a federal grant. And then my favorite thing to do is to then use the federal grant to match a state grant, okay? And uh, that can be a little tricky, has to be done correctly and legally, um, but that way you don't have to actually come up with the match money. What you can't ever do is you can't ever use one federal grant to match another federal grant, or one state grant to match another state grant. Uh, but it's a good way to come up with the match. Making match money out of thin air, those are like secret consulting things that we do. Um, that's all I'm going to say there. It's, it's magic. Now, what are the basic elements of a grant? I break it down into three components. The idea, the funding source, and then the actual writing of the application. The three main components. And I'm going to talk about each of those in turn. So first I'm going to talk about the idea. So I have what I call the six elements of a good idea. It has to be innovative. It should involve a lot of partners. People like to give money to projects, have a lot of partners because they feel they're having a greater impact. It should address some kind of real need, whether it's a community need or a scientific need, but it's addressing some kind of need. It has realistic and measurable objectives. Organizational buy-in is critical. And you use your client input to develop your ideas. And I'm going to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. So first, I'm going to talk about innovation. So if you look it up, innovation is the introduction of something new, a new idea, method, or device. You could use an old idea, but you're applying it with a new twist. Like Chris, maybe you're doing some kind of study that's been done before, and uh, it's a kind of a standard thing, but you come up with a new innovative way of testing it slightly differently and hoping to get better results. So that would be something old, but with a new twist. Adopting innovation that has been tried elsewhere to your situation. So you're, I'm going to talk about this more, but you're going to do a lot of reading, right? And you see somebody else, somewhere else, maybe some organization in California has tried out some new innovative idea that sounds really cool, but that idea has never been tried in Maryland, okay? So you could sort of borrow their innovative idea, apply it in Maryland. It's innovative in Maryland because it hasn't been tried here, okay? To do that requires a lot of research. So if you're interested in a certain segment, uh, for example, maybe crime. Okay, you might be doing a lot of reading of crime journals and reading what other researchers are doing or what police departments are doing, what new innovative methods that they're using, and you can think about how you could apply those to your projects. When you do that, and I'm going to talk a, more about organization, but when you're doing that kind of research, you have to save it. You have to organize it so that you can find it later. Okay, because if, if, if you're like me, sometimes I get on the internet, and next thing I know, I'm in some weird website somewhere that was 10 clicks away from where I started, and I read it, I go, it's pretty cool, and I go onto another web page, and I will never find that again, okay, on the internet. So you might want to bookmark it and sort of document where it was, and you sort of build up this library of sort of innovation ideas that you're seeing from other groups, 
and you can easily go back and find it again so you don't waste hours on the internet. The quality of the idea counts, you know, is it, is it from some expert who's well published, for example, a PhD that's got some, you know, support and some documentation on their research? Uh, that really matters in terms of your ideas. Next thing I want to talk about is partners. Um, establish networks in your community. Now, Bonnie, I'm going to pick on Bonnie here for a minute. Uh, Bonnie actually writes grants for some local uh, community organizations, and I'm confident that she has reached out and networked with other people she thinks she could partner with. She's done that now in advance building those community networks and partnerships, it, you don't want to wait until you see a funding application that's due in three weeks and then start to try to establish a community network, okay? You have to do that in advance so that when you get a grant application comes in, you can just pick up the phone and go, hey, Sally, I need a letter of support for this grant. And Sally already knows who you are, what you're doing, and can react quickly, okay? How do you do that? Well, attend community meetings, okay? You're going to get yourself out and about, network. Amanda's doing this now for us in the GIS lab. She's connecting with networks that we've never connected with before. And uh, then someday she can call them up, and they know who she is and uh, ready to go. So I'm really encouraging not only Amanda to do that, but everyone that works for me to do that. Go to conferences and meet people. So Erica and Emily from my office actually just went to the International Association of Crime Analysts, attended a number of sessions, met some new people. Uh, hopefully they're following up with that by connecting with them on LinkedIn and those kind of things so that they have these contacts for the future. Now, when you're going for a grant and you want partners to participate in your project, it's important that they actually have a role in the project. So it's not just like, hey, you're my partner, I'm going to get a $100,000 grant, I'm going to keep all the money myself, thanks for partnering, okay? <laughs> that does not make a good partnership, okay? So I put this up here. Uh, the problem with partners is they want a piece of what you get. So partners are good, but you don't want to go after a $100,000 grant and have 15 partners that all want a share, you know, there's some, some balance there. Your idea has to address some type of real community need. Um, how do you document that need? Okay, so what we do is we collect statistics, census demographics. You know, let's say you're trying to get a project for Kent County. Well, you better know, you know, what's the uh, poverty level in Kent County? You know, what's the racial makeup? Um, everything you can know about Kent County you want to know. You can go to the state government and get information that may not be available in census demographics. You're just really building up this arsenal of data that you can use. Now, you're going to do this in advance of even applying for a grant. You're going to start collecting these stats. That way you have this, it's sort of like a, a bookcase of data on your project area. And then when you get the grant, if it's looking for this or looking for that, you just go whoosh, and you put it right in your grant instead of the week before the grants due, going, hey, you know, geez, I, oh, they want to know, like, how many women in Kent County are single head of households with an income below 25000 And for those of you that are familiar with census data, sometimes answering those kind of questions can be, you know, first off you go, uh, <laughs> where is the bottle of Excedrin? <laughs> because you need that first before you get on a federal data website. Customer data, so if you're an organization, a community organization, say in Kent County, which I, I believe you are from, you should be collecting extensive data on your customer database. They come in and see you every day. You should be asking them questions, doing surveys, and basically having a great understanding of your client base. That way, when you write the grant, you'd be very extremely knowledgeable, and it helps you address and document and prove that you actually have a true need for the grant that you're going after. Now, the other thing you can do is you can hold community meetings. So let's say for the Center for Environment Society, uh, you want to do a project, uh, I don't know, oysters or living shoreline. So you might, you might hold a community meeting of all the people that you know have docs, which you know because the GIS department can tell you that, and then you would bring them all together 
and you'd have a meeting, you'd sign them up in advance, and then when you go for the grant, you already know who they are, and you can reach out really quickly and pull them in, uh, kind of thing. And you collect the data that way. I put peer meetings in there, so if you're a faculty member at the college, you know, and, and you're thinking about this, you might want to have these little meetings with your peer faculty, or if you're in GIS or in uh, the Center for Environment Society, talk to your colleagues and sort of start brainstorming and collecting this stuff in advance. Needs assessment reports, uh, you can actually do these in advance. Um, interview your whole organization, have this data, you know, put together. This is something I think that we need actually for GIS, It'd be something that we probably should do um, to sort of beef up, you know, what's, what are some of our weaknesses? If someone came up to me tomorrow and said, hey, there's an opportunity for $200,000 to buy equipment, but you have to let me know by Friday, I would go, uh, well, I, probably, I could probably use like, I don't know, you know, what, what do we need in our lab? Uh, that would be covered by a needs assessment. And then, again, document, document, organize, because in the crunch time, and this happens, for those of you that know me, it's like Monday, oh boy, there's a grant, it's due Friday, you don't have time to like be searching for that. Now, admittedly, my desk is a mess, I admit that, you know, but uh, you want to be able to pull the stuff in really quickly, it has to be organized. So, I talked about realistic objectives. They don't have to be incredibly complex. They can be very simple, very straightforward. Um, you don't want to have these fuzzy objectives, like, I'm trying to think of a good example of one, like, uh, this grant will make Chestertown a better place to live. That's pretty fuzzy, you know. No, this grant will reduce the flow of stormwater into the Chester River by 10%. That's a very simple objective, has a very clear, you know, not fuzzy. You want to avoid unrealistic and unachievable objectives. I'm applying for a grant from the National Science Foundation, and due to this grant, the GPAs of every student at Washington College will be raised to 3.8. <laughs> Sounds good though, doesn't it? But it's not realistic. Organizational buy-in at Washington College, this is critical, okay, for those of you that work for the college. And it's because a lot of the projects go out the door, you know, before they go out the door, like I, I do a million dollar National Science Foundation grant, not only does the dean have to approve it, but the chief financial officer of the college has to approve it. So if they're not buying into my idea, I will have spent hundreds of hours working on the application only to have one of those two people say, no. And that would, that would really be upsetting. <coughs> Input from your peers is very essential. I mean, if you're a faculty member, let's say you're in the uh, biology department, you know, and you're gonna go for some big grant, it'd be a really good idea that your fellow biology faculty kind of bought into your idea, uh, just makes it a lot easier. But, you gotta be careful, if you get too many people getting involved, it becomes too complex and unwieldy, and you end up not being able to write an effective application. Customer input, I talked about this a little bit. Survey your customers. Do they think your idea is good? So do they buy into your idea? Will they come and partake of your idea? This goes back to like the oysters, you know. You get a big grant to put oyster cages at the end of docks, but if you don't have 100 homeowners already ready to do it, <coughs> kind of a dumb grant. And then this is very important, and you can write this into your application. You survey your customers, you listen to what they say, and then in your grant, you can talk about the fact that you surveyed your customers, you learned something new, and you modified your proposal to make it better fit the customer. Grant reviewers love that. And then, of course, tabulate all your results. I put that in at the end there. It's called ask for letters of support early. So you want to let these people know that you're going to be asking for a letter. You don't have to write it right then, but you want to prep people for that. Hey, I'm going to need a letter. A lot of your partners might say, um, hey, that's really great, but I'm not the one who's authorized to sign that letter. 
This actually happened on a national Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant that we wanted to go for. We had a couple of people that I know them really well. They're like, yeah, I can't sign it. And I didn't get a letter because it, I, I waited until the last minute to ask. You know. So what if no one likes your idea? Brad, you got an idea? I want to pick on you sitting in the front row. It's dangerous to sit in the front row. Not specifically. I can come up with one real quick. Maybe well, let's say Brad wanted to come up with an idea to, I don't know. Land things, like mapping things. Mapping land. That actually sounds like a good idea. I like that. Unmeltable ice cream. I don't know. There actually is something like that, what they call the okay, dots, dot spots. <laughs> so you can do a couple of things. One, you can start over with your idea. If it's really bad, that might be a good idea. Okay. <laughs> Second, you can just say, I give up. The heck with this grant stuff, you know. Or you can do what I do sometimes. I just kind of go for it. Now, I put this up here because this actually impacts a lot of what we do. But some of what, you, what we do is radical and disruptive innovation. By definition, people will not like your idea, okay, because it's too radical. They don't want to be disrupted, okay? So there's a certain point where, you know, but if 100 people don't like your idea, it's probably not a good idea, you know. <laughs> you got to get some people to buy into it. All right, want to talk about funding sources. Number one important thing for funding sources is networking. So I'm going to pick on Erica here, okay? So Erica, you're at the IACA conference with a bunch of other crime analysts from cities across the planet being the International Association. Did you learn of one funding source that you never heard of before? Just one. Like some, did you ask anybody like, that is a really cool project. How the heck did you pay for that? Well, that's good. See, that's what you have to do. I know, which is unfortunate. So it's it, it, yeah. <laughs> the other way you do it is through research. And when I'm talking about research here, I'm talking about getting on the internet and uh, typing in whatever your idea is, and then the word grant or funding, okay, and just surf the net. You know, look for look for ideas. I do that about once every couple weeks to be honest with you. I just sit there and I go, not like I don't have enough to do already, but I go, hmm, GIS grants, there's something new out there. I recommend that if you're serious about getting grants, that you set aside about 30 minutes a week and you look for funding opportunities. You know, you just carve it out. Maybe it's Tuesday morning at 8.30 or something like that. You just spend some time on the net looking around you know, what's out there in terms of funding. So who's got the cash? John talked about this a little bit. You have federal sources, state sources, private foundations, local businesses or corporations, and internal sources. Now, unfortunately, this year, the internal source capacity of the college is a little, you know, a little tight. Web-based research, um, I, I'm not going to go into this as an example, but uh, what I like to do is when I'm doing my research, I actually write down the search terms. So if you Google GIS grant and see what you get, and then you Google GIS grants, you actually get two different responses. So you want to kind of come up with some canned search terms. You put them in a little Word document. And then when you're doing your searches, you just kind of run through them so you don't have to think them up. Then you're doing a systematic search of the internet on a weekly basis. I used multiple search engines. We were just doing this the other day in the lab. We were typing uh, GIS into Google, and uh, our program came up number three, which I thought was pretty good. And then we typed GIS into Bing, and we didn't see ourselves, okay? But multiple search engines will give you different results, okay? When I find a website that's of interest to me, I bookmark it, okay? 
You can actually organize your bookmarks. You guys know how to do that? You save a bookmark, you can create little subfolders, and that way you can go back the next week and just hit the site again and see if there's anything new without having to refind it all over again. Now, if you've ever noticed this, when you make bookmarks, sometimes the bookmark names are these long, complicated, weird things that don't make sense. When you organize your bookmarks, you can rename them. Money from NIJ, right? So something really simple. You don't have to think about what it is when you're doing your web research. So internal research strategies, wake up and ask yourself and others, where is the money today? I, I have to say this. I love the smell of money in the morning. So This actually happened to me once. I was working at Mifflin County. Uh, the commissioner's office was across the hall from my office. And I walked over to the commissioner's office, and I walked in like this. And I went up to Peggy, who's the commissioner's secretary, and I said, uh, She'd actually given me some liquid fuels money the year before to buy street signs. And I just walked in and I asked her, I said, you got any of that extra liquid fuels money today? And she goes, oh my, yes we do. We have this major problem. We have a $150,000 short oversight. And if we don't do something, I'll have to redistribute among 16 municipalities. And I just don't know what to do. Well, why don't you just let me spend it? <laughs> oh, that'd be wonderful. Can you do that? <laughs> you bet I can. It's very important you do this. Keep your need for funding well known amongst your coworkers. This is another Mifflin County story. I told everybody in that courthouse that if a grant came across their desk, I didn't care what it was for, to please give me a copy of it. So one day the head of social services walked into my office with a grant and said, I meant to give this to you a month ago, but on page 67 it said the word GIS. And I went, oh, thank you. And I looked at it, and of course, it was Monday. And the first thing I look for is the due date. The due date was Friday. That turned out to be the single largest grant I ever got in Mifflin County, $567,000 grant, and I wrote it in three days. And it was a big honking grant. I just said, well, I guess I'm not doing anything else this week. <laughs> Shut my door and like started typing. And that's where this comes from. Doesn't matter what it is. Get people to show it to you. You decide whether there's a connection to something that you have. Now I put this down here. This is, this is not totally relevant here at Washington College. But at the Mifflin County Courthouse, I made it a point to study the budget of every department on campus every month, or on the, on the courthouse every month. And what I noticed, one day I noticed that the district justice had $120,000 in the budget that hadn't been spending. I wonder what that is. So I went down and talked to him. He goes, oh, that's a mistake. They put this money in my budget for something that I'm not going to do. And I go, well, I can spend that money for you. Oh, that's fine by me. No problem. I actually bought new computers for the entire courthouse uh, out of that money. So, and he, he signed the purchase rec for me worked out really good. Other research strategies, Now I haven't done this as much as I used to, but it's always a good idea to be paying attention to the politicians. The Maryland legislature is meeting in the spring. They're going to pass new bills. They're going to pass a funding appropriation. They may create some new grant program. There's actually one that's, uh, I can't remember the name of it right now. It's uh, some workforce development grant uh, that's going on in Maryland. The money is so new that the people who have it don't even have a mechanism for people to submit proposals. I love stuff like that because I can go to them like, well, I already have a proposal, and I know you don't know what you're doing, but here's my proposal right now. It's a great idea. And they'll go, well, we really want to get something going on this because the governor just signed this, and they give me the money. So it's a good deal. Same with the federal budgets. You should know... Agencies that you're going after, you know, how much have they funded a program that you're interested in this year? And knowing in advance means you can plan for it appropriately. Ask your contacts from networking, what do they know about any new funding program? Because when a new funding program comes out, not many people are going to know about it. And what does that do? 
It limits competition. The next year or the second year of the fund, everybody and their brother is going to know about it, okay? And then you review what was actually passed, which is not the same thing as what was proposed, okay? But the motto here is the early bird gets the worm, okay, for new funding sources. Now, once you find the grant that you're interested in, that you think has some possibilities, what I do, I go through this little drill. Who did they fund last year? Okay. Sometimes I will write those people. I am not bashful at all. It's like, uh, hey, you just got, you know, you got five hundred thousand dollars last year from this foundation. You know. Can I, can I get a copy of your proposal? I mean, you got your money, right? So you'd be surprised how many people will share their entire proposal with you, okay? You can ask the funding agency for copies. Now, I pissed off the USDA once when I asked them for a copy of every single distance and learning telemedicine grant they'd ever awarded for the last 10 years. There's this little thing called the Freedom of Information Act. And... Uh, they really stonewall me on it, but and I decided not to aggressively pursue it. This is important, and, and John said this. Call the funding agency, and I call it run your idea at the flagpole. Now, I remember, I'm going back to Mifflin County stories here, but uh, I actually uh, went down to Harrisburg once with an idea that I had, and I and actually wrote a little something up on it, and I met with the state representative. They loved my idea. And they asked me the question, which I hate. How much money do you need? Oh, well, I, I hadn't really thought of that, you know. Because I want to ask, what do you want to ask someone who asks you that question? <laughs> How much money do you have? <laughs> That's very kind of rude, you know. So I want all your money, you know, kind of thing. I actually said 100000 and then uh, and they were, they were like, oh, that would be fine. So when I submitted, I submitted 177,000 and got every dollar of it. So. so that's why I put this slide in here, white papers work. Now, you guys know what a white paper is? A white paper is like a concept paper. It's typically one page long. It's like your idea in a one page document, suitable for going to a funding agency and just handing them something like, here's my little one page summary of my idea do you think this would fly? Okay. You don't want to sit there and write a 15-page white paper, but it's a good way to kind of quickly check to see if your idea looks good to them. So, and it doesn't take very long. I mean, if you can't write a one-page summary of your idea, then you're kind of in trouble. So I put this up here. I call this uh, Stu's Top Ten Grants. And uh, my number one favorite has to be the Governor's Office of Crime Control and Prevention. I think we're up to about, uh, I think I lost track a little bit, but maybe $2.9 million so far. Uh, they do have a lot of interesting grants there for other categories. Maryland State Department of Education, uh, we actually have one very small grant from MSDE, but they have a lot of money. So for those of you that work for me, like Amanda and Emily, um, we need to make some more contacts and, and connecting with them uh, and see what we can do. National Science Foundation was mentioned, uh, a massive source of funding for all kinds of things, pretty much every scientific discipline uh, you could think of, extremely competitive. Uh, we submitted a grant to National Science Foundation about two years ago, spent a lot of time on it, and they received, I think, 242 applications and awarded eight. So, and it was a big, honky, gnarly application that was really hard to do. Um, so they're tough, but it would have been for $1.2 million. So it would have been a great grant. And we're going to reapply again, okay? So, because I have reviewers' comments. So sometimes you get a grant, it looks a little gnarly. You're, you're, you're pretty sure you're not going to get it, okay? You always have to go in with that attitude, like, I'm probably not going to get this grant. So you could say, I'm just not even going to try. 
Or you can go, no, I'm going to give it my best effort. Who knows, maybe I only have a 0.1% chance of getting it. But when you submit it, what you get back for your hard work is you get the reviewer comments. And then you can apply the second time with the benefit of the reviewer comments. Now, the only downside to that is each year you submit, you'll have different reviewers, okay? Uh, but still, you have some idea where they thought your application was weak, uh, things like that. It's extremely useful. Uh, and it's a strategy that a lot, I believe, researchers use uh, because a lot of people will tell you, you're probably not going to get the first NSF grant you apply for, but you have a good shot of getting it the second time around from what you learned the first time. I put EPA here. Uh, Ashley was talking to Tony about this. The EPA, we are in the Center for Environment and Society. By George, we should be able to get an EPA grant for the GIS program. Don't you think, Tony? And then Tony writes the grant, and Tony can then fill and do the work, you know, that kind of thing. So there's some, I think, motivation for some of my staff. You know, if you'd like to do something totally different, you could write a grant and bring the money in, and then you can help you know, basically do that project. But they have a lot of money. National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, this is something that Amanda's going to be working on in our office. Small little grant, you know, a few, few hundred thousand dollars. Um, and we, have, we actually have a great idea that's been incubating since 1980, uh, the Pluckerman Project. And uh, so we have a lot, you know, it's, we're going to get that grant the first time. And if we don't, the second time for sure, okay? But we're going to go for it. It's not due till January. We have time to do it. And uh, Amanda had already has some contacts there, which is extremely helpful. I put this up here, USDA Rural Utility Service. Uh, we've actually gotten one grant here at the college for a half million dollars. And then my, uh, I do a lot of, uh, not as much as I used to, but I do private grant writing. And uh, I've nailed these every year for my hospital clients. It's just like, it's, a, it's almost a formula where you understand the criteria of the grant and you attack that directly and it's scored competitively. And you can tell exactly how it's scored. And once you meet the minimum threshold, you get the money. So, it, and there's no evaluation. It's a great grant. Um, my favorite grant. National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. This is a, a really huge uh, foundation. It's, it's like quasi-federal, but they do get um, private donations to the foundation. And we have, uh, between the center, the Chester River Association, and my operations, we have five grants that have been submitted, and we're all waiting. We actually just got an email from them that said they were overwhelmed with requests, there's going to be some delays in letting you know. The first people that know will be people that didn't get the grant. I haven't got an email yet. Keep my fingers crossed. So, Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Well, that's how GIS, as John said, got started at Washington College. $100,000 Mellon grant. So they deserve to be up there as one of my favorite grants, right? I put the Pew Charitable Trust. You may or may not know this, but the executive director of the Pew Charitable Trust sits on guess who's board of visitors and governors? Washington colleges. This kind of grant here, you must go through the advancement office for, because you can almost guarantee that you're not the only one who thought it'd be a great idea to get money from the Pew Charitable Trust. I've actually been expressly told by someone who was here earlier to, you know. But they have a lot of money. I think their endowment's somewhere in the $5 billion range, something like that. I put Verizon Foundation on here, just an example of a corporate grant. Um, I do actually pro bono grant work. And uh, when I was up in uh, PA, I supported my local Lumina Center for Disadvantaged Kids, and I'd write them a Verizon grant uh, every year, build a computer lab, stuff like that. They're small grants, they're like 15, 20,000 bucks, two or three pages long. And for some of you here looking for an easy grant to try to write, Verizon Foundation would be a good target. Uh, maybe it's to support something like uh, the alley, 
which is a little after school thing that's right here in Chestertown. You don't have to write a grant to support yourself. You could write a grant to support some needy organization in the community. That would be a great project. It would make me very happy that you help someone out in the community as a result of this course. Other possible sources of funding, as John indicated, how many billions of dollars are out there for us to get? What did he write down there? $500 billion or something like? 200 billion dollars from how many different organizations? Uh, a million. Uh, yeah. That's a lot of, uh, I just showed you 10. So once you've identified a grant source, what do you do? You got to get the application packet. I put this up here for a reason. You know why? Any ideas why? That's correct. And I, coming from, graduated from the School of Hard Knocks, actually filled a grant application once using the wrong year's application packet. Oops. Didn't get the grant either. Um, you can download it. I like to download them and get the word copy so I can cut and paste and put them in my documents. Some people will mail you a packet or you get on their mailing list. So maybe you're busy that week and you didn't do your research, so you missed the fact that the grant period opened. But if you register, a lot of grant organizations will send you a friendly email letting you know that you can now apply for this grant. That's even better than research. It just pops up in your email. Oh, great. This actually happens with the Delaware Project, right? Poof, got an email. Now I can look. At, so I didn't have to remember to go to that one website because I might have missed it or lost two weeks of time to prepare the application. Time can be critical. There's a lot of short deadlines. So the third and final phase is write the application. I like this picture because in some respects, this is what you have to do. This is why I write a lot of my grants at night. You got to hole up somewhere where you're not going to be disturbed and put on your old thinking cap and start to write. So getting started, is it time to write? Or is it time to plan your strategy? So do you think I go back home and I just sit there and go and write the grant? I can't lie. Sometimes I actually do that, okay? <laughs> like this weekend I have to write a proposal that's due Monday. And I'm pretty sure looking at my schedule for this weekend, considering it's fall family fun day this weekend, that I'm probably not going to write the grant until Sunday night. So everything I'm about to tell you here, I'm not going to do, okay? But I've written a lot of grants, okay? And I can get away with that. I don't think you guys can, okay? At least not until you get a couple under your belt. So first thing I look at always every grant is when is the deadline? Is it realistic that you're going to be able to write a grant? Because if you look at it, and, and let's say it is due Friday, and that's like tomorrow, you're not going to be able to do it. You know. You can think about, I'm going to put this in the tickler file for next year, right? And you can start working on it in advance. How many pages? There are some federal grants, and I'm specifically talking about HRSA grants. May, no, I won't say anything. Please limit your narrative to 30 single-spaced pages. You know how hard it is to write 30 pages? I've done it before, and I, I didn't like it. So you have this reality check, okay? Let's say it's due in two weeks is a 30-page single-spaced narrative. You look last year, and they had 700 applicants and gave out five grants. Unless your idea is like the best thing since sliced bread, you might just want to go, is it worth 100 hours of my time to do it? And I do this sometimes. I go, well, nah. I, it looks great, but it's just not going to happen. You can pull teams in to help you. Keep in mind that earlier slide about too many cooks, OK? Having one other person is really helpful. Um, most of my large grants 
Dr. Seidel helps me out. I'll shoot it off to him. He'll do some editing. You know, Bonnie's going to be helping us with that. It helps to have another set of eyes looking at your application. And one of the things that Bonnie's going to be doing is you write your application. If you stay on track with our assignments, you're going to have professional, successful grant writers review your application and give you tips and suggestions before you submit it. So that's a big part of this course. I carefully read the applications. I read it a couple times because I might have missed something. Um, actually, I wrote this really great application a few years back, and I personally think it was the best grant I've ever written. It was so good, I thought it would fit into two different categories. So I wrote two grants, and I submitted them, and I waited and waited and waited, and I finally called up and said, hey, how are my grants doing? They go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I remember you now. Yeah, it uh, said on page 79 you could only submit for one category, so when your grant applications arrived, we threw them away. <laughs> oh. Thank you. School hard knocks. I like to do checklists. So if I need to get certain things, I'll do a little spreadsheet. I'll have a little checklist. I need sponsor letters. I need to review with the budget. I need to you know, uh, do a strategic academic goals alignment with the college's provost. You know, I'll just write all these things down so I don't forget anything because you're, you're busy, remember, with your regular job, so you're fitting this in amongst your other stuff. But having a little checklist, again, organization is the key to efficiency. Timeline that you need information. Do you want to wait till the day before the grant is due to get all your letters from your sponsors? No. You'd like to collect those a week in advance. I like to prepare an outline of the grant. Outlining is an important writing strategy. And then I like to do this thing here. By looking back at the application, you know, let's say that 20% of the application is based on the evaluation. I'm going to put a 20% next to that. So if I have a 10-page narrative and 20% of the application is the evaluation, I probably should have about two pages dedicated to the evaluation, not one paragraph. So you can kind of weight your page limit and your outline based on what you know the ranking criteria is for the grant. Partner letters, you'd be amazed at uh, how important these are. The number one importance is if you're limited to, say, five pages, but you attach 20 partner letters or just letters of support, those letters of support don't count towards the page limit. And each letter is another chance for you to sell your idea. Your partners are as busy as you are. So if you ask a partner, hey, like so I'll ask Andrew, Andrew, can you write me a letter of support? Andrew will go, sure. Because I know you're writing. What's that? Because I know you're writing. Well, yeah, but if you didn't know that, <laughs> and I didn't, add, I didn't say I would write it, you might go, Dear Sirs, my organization strongly supports this grant application. Thank you. <laughs> write more than one letter. I'm telling you, I reviewed grants, and I've seen 10 letters of support, and every letter was exactly the same. It doesn't look authentic. Now, the bad part about this is it takes a little bit of time to craft 10 separate letters of support unique to the organization, you know, but I write little bullets is what I do. Like, these are the things I want the letters of support to say, and I'll just sit there and, like, hammer them out. Or I can ask Bonnie to help me, you know. It's like, it's like handcrafted beer, you know. It's a handcrafted letter. The reviewers will notice because the next application they look at will have 10 letters of support that are exactly the same. It doesn't really show buy-in from your supporters if it's just a carbon copy letter with a different signature and a different letterhead. I do this a lot. Since I write the partner letters, then I can use the partner letters to expand upon the key points of why my idea is really great and should be funded. If you're able to put a letter in, it's a full page 
fill it with text. Don't write these little short letters, a bunch of white space in there. Take advantage of the space that you have and craft a really decent letter. Very important, if the letter is committing them to something like in-kind staff support or maybe they're going to throw a couple thousand bucks in as match, the letter has to clearly say, our organization will commit 100 hours of staff time, will donate $2,000, will help publicize the events that are going to be held to our constituency. You know, it's got to call out really concrete, really bold, easy to find in the letter what they're doing to assist you. I talked about the outline, and actually our, our last session, our last workshop is going to be a writer's workshop, okay? And we're going to go over this uh, a little bit more detail. I basically, and I think I messed this up here, uh, it should be, I kind of modify my outline. I write inside my outline, okay? And then when I'm writing, if I hit a section I'm not sure about, I can just skip over it and write what I know kind of fill the pieces out, and I convert that outline into the finished application. So what I do is, like, if the grant says, please explain why X, Y, Z, I will copy that from the narrative, and I'll pop it right in my outline. So as I'm writing, I'm looking exactly at what the grant wanted me to talk about. So I'm responding directly to the you know, RFP and answering the questions that they've asked specifically. If you separate the two, sometimes you can get kind of mixed up and, and you end up writing something that had nothing to do with the question they wanted you to answer. So I'm going to kind of run through this really quickly. These are sort of the typical sections of a grant. Uh, typically have a needs assessment. You're going to sort of talk about, you know, the needs of your community. I like to tell people, you know, well, I'm from Washington College. We're a very small liberal arts college. We're located in the most rural county in Maryland, suffering from abject poverty and severe economic depression. I'm surprised that we're even still standing. It's so bad. And then there was the floods, the hurricanes, and, you know, tick infestations. You know, you're painting a picture that's, that's going to portray your community not in the best light. Because everything's hunky-dory rosy, then you don't need any money, right? So you've got to, you've got to really hit that needs section. In that needs assessment, you're going to put a lot of stats. You don't want to have mind-numbing, hard-to-read stats. You want to have pleasant tables, easy-to-read graphs. Um, very important, and all of you should know this already. You know, if you put a table or a graph into your narrative, you must mention it in the text. As seen in table one, blah, blah, blah. You know, so you're, you're kind of calling it out twice. Need I say more? All my grants have cool math. I use note cards to sort of uh, keep track of all the stats. Uh, how many of you guys use note cards when you write? Really? Just a few of you? It's very helpful to kind of shovel stuff around and keep it organized. No cards are good. Pictures. I actually use these in my grants. Because you got to think, like, you're this reviewer, right? And you probably got, like, 20 applications to read. And you're probably doing them, who knows, late at night. You're kind of, oh, I got another one to go. You know, so you pop in this weird little kind of picture in there, kind of lighten the mood up a little bit, and uh, make the reviewer kind of feel better. If you could slip in a cold beer with your application, that would be really helpful, but I don't think you can do that. <laughs> budget section, I will admit, I absolutely hate doing budgets. So sometimes I tackle them first, okay, just to get them out of the way. Here at the college... If you do a grant that's for the college and you do a budget, what do you think that you probably should do with that budget? What's that? Get it reviewed. Get it reviewed. And who would review it at Washington College? I mentioned her name earlier. Debbie, Debbie Gannon. Have Debbie look it over, you know. And then that way when you go see the CFO, you can go, <coughs> well, 
Debbie Gannon's already reviewed this. Of course, he'll probably want some verification of that because, you know, that's just the kind of guy Jim is. The budget justification narrative, usually required. So, yes, I put in uh, $37,000 for new desktop computers because I thought it was a great idea. And uh, it's always good to have new computers, right, Andrew? But you got to justify that. You know, we need new computers because our current computers are five years old and are not capable of handling the intensive graphics processing necessary to complete the grant objectives in a timely manner. You know, something like that. I put that business off review, already said that. You know, this kind of stuff, supplies, you know, you're writing a grant. If they have a section for supplies, you probably need some supplies, you know. You'd be amazed how many pens and paper clips and stuff like that you need. Don't short yourself on, you know, things. I, I actually probably tend to not put supplies in because some of our some of our grants, like if I put it in there, then I gotta find a receipt for every paper clip I bought. And I kind of go, eh, I don't need any supplies. Just makes my life easier. Uh, but if you're a smaller organization, you probably need to get some money for that or you know. Indirect expenses, um, I'll throw this out here. Uh, our on-campus rate is 44%. Uh, we have an off-campus rate too, which, which sometimes applies to us if I think it's to our advantage. Um, like I wanna charge rent as a direct expense, then I'm gonna claim a 20%. Um, some grants are capped. Uh, for example, our state grants, the state just says, we're not paying more than 8%. We don't care what your federal indirect rate is. We're paying 8%, in which case you put in 8%. And then some grants have, some grants specifically say you're not allowed any indirect expenses. And then what do you do then? You go, shucks. The narrative, try to buzz through this a little bit here. Typically you have a methodology, you know, how are you going to do your project? How are you going to accomplish the, you know, the goals of the grant, sort of step by step. You've got to convince whoever's reviewing it that you know what you're doing, okay, before they give you 50,000, 100,000, or 5,000 bucks. Um, they want to know that. You should have a work plan. A lot of times I'll end up putting my work plan actually into a spreadsheet, and I'll have grant objective, work task, measurable outcome, who's going to do it. And you can cram a lot of information into a table like that. It's much easier to read than trying to put it in paragraph format where people have to work to try to figure out what you're saying. Table just pops out. Plus in tables, you usually get away with making the font size a little bit smaller so you can cram more stuff into it. Challenges. It's important that you recognize what the challenges are going to be to accomplishing your project because the grant reviewer probably does, and if you don't mention them, then they're gonna go, you don't really know what you're doing, but if you don't realize there's gonna be a really big challenge to do what you're trying to do. You need to address the challenge and talk about how your grant's gonna deal with it up front. You know, deal with the problems up front, don't sort of hide, or hide from them. Valuation I talked about a little bit. Many grants require this. Um, typically it's about 20% uh, of most grants is how you're gonna evaluate it. When you do your budgets, if 20% should be evaluation, typically your budget, 20% of your budget should probably be allocated towards evaluation. You know, you can't go, yeah, we'll evaluate the whole thing for a million dollars, but we only need to spend 5,000 on the evaluation. It's just not realistic, so. To me, this, this really has to come out. Why are you the best organization to pull this great idea off? This is a sales pitch, okay? You gotta sell yourself. You gotta make people wanna give you money because they believe in your organization. That's gotta come across. This is really, to me, grant writing, in many respects, is persuasive writing. You gotta persuade the person to cough up the cash, and uh, this is a very important part. The introduction, I never write the introduction first. Many times, I'm really not sure how the grant's gonna flesh out until I write it. So you wanna come back and write the intro 
because then you know what's in your narrative and you can really use the intro to introduce the concepts and the rest of the um, body. So pretty easy steps. This is who we are. This is our community. We got a great need for your support. We have the best idea since sliced bread. And everybody agrees with us. And so should you. Okay. Now, once you start writing, you got your first draft you're going to do. You're probably going to send that to some of your partners to get their feedback. I use track changes in Word. You guys all use that? It's pretty helpful, so you can see who did what. They have a, how many use Google Docs? You know, you can have, that's actually really neat stuff. You can have a, I, I'm not very good with it. I'm a little older than you guys, or some of you at least. <laughs> and uh, it's too, like, high tech for me. I, I don't know. Sometimes I really just have a printed copy. But Google Docs, you can have, like, I've actually done one grant with someone we had three people at the same time in Google Docs, and people were typing and editing at the same time. It was like, ugh, kind of unnerving a little bit for me. You write something, you think it's really good. One of your partners said they think it's a really bad idea, but you think it's really good. I have this thing I call, well, my gut says, thanks for your comment, but I'm not going to listen to you, okay? you got to judge that, okay? But bottom line is, writing is rewriting, okay? You spit something out the night before, and you guys, term papers, I know you do it. I did it too. You know, you spit that term paper out, you submit it the next day. If you'd have sat on it for a day, got a good night's sleep, went back and looked at it again, you're gonna, you can make it better, okay? Always make something better by rewriting. Now, the second draft is what you show your boss. I made a mistake once of accidentally submitting a grant that wasn't fully fleshed out to our, to our dean, and all it did was confuse her, and I shall never do that again, okay? I want to make sure it's pretty well polished before I show it up the chain. Polish it. Now, this part here, you've got to make it easier for the reviewer to understand what the heck it is you're trying to say. So I really like to connect my paragraph. So when I end one paragraph, and this is just basic writing, really. I end one paragraph, I'm leading you into the next paragraph, OK? So I'm kind of following you along. It's like, come with me through the grant. You know, it's just like a little choreography, very simple to read, very simple to understand. I like doing this a lot. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, tell them again. Tell them in the intro, tell them in the body, tell them in the conclusion. There is no doubt, boom, 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 these are the points I'm trying to get across. Again, making it easier for the reviewer. Forms, these federal grants, they'll kill you. You know, please make sure you fill out the 17 attached forms. Debarment, uh, I'm trying to remember what they all are. What are some of them, Bonnie? You got debarment, civil rights, drug and alcohol, affirmation forms. If you're missing a single form, your grant will be rejected immediately. Just imagine there's somebody somewhere in a federal office whose job it is to make sure that you're not missing a form. If you miss a form, boom, into the trash can it goes. They're trying to eliminate as many as possible, okay? I've had a grant come back because I forgot the little note that said it must be signed in blue ink. Oops. Some forms require legal review. So if you go the day the grant's due and you're trying to get someone to sign a form, they look at it and go, I don't know about this form. This, this form looks pretty, uh, <clears throat> I think our lawyer needs to look at it. Do any of you know a lawyer who will give you a response in less than a week? Sometimes two. I like typing the forms instead of hand. It looks more professional. Right color ink. So final prep. I always like doing this. Reread the section on delivery. Oh, shoot, I needed 10 copies of the grant 
not in a binder with a loose leaf clip in a brown box with white tape, whatever it is. Again, if you don't satisfy the requirements, you'll get rejected. Paper electronic, a lot of grants now you can submit electronically, it's pretty cool. Make sure any copies of original don't get screwed up. I tell you, if I spend 150 hours working on a grant and it needs 10 copies, and if a single copy that's messed up will delete my grant, guess who I'm going to ask to do the copies? No offense against some of my fine students here, but I'm not going to ask Alex to make the copies for me. I'm going to do them myself because, you know, they got to be right. No offense, Alex. They are. It's easy to get messed up. I'm telling you, they are. They're harder than you think. Plus, I get paranoid at the end. It's like a ritual I go through, you know, kind of like. It works for me. USPS or FedEx, if you're sending something to the federal government, which of the two do you think you should use? Should you use the federal USPS or FedEx? No. Absolutely not. Because anything that goes USPS is going to get irradiated to remove anthrax. And if you have it on a nice little binder, if you know anything about irradiation, get really hot, it's going to melt your binder. Okay. But if you send it FedEx, it doesn't get irradiated. I'm telling you. Yeah. I don't think UPS gives out grants, do they? Do they really? So that's something I didn't know. Packaging, you know, you want to make sure it doesn't get banged up. Especially when you got a big box with like 10 binders and the grants this thick, you know, things like that. I like certified delivery. Let there be no mistake that, yes, indeed, my grant got to your organization on the deadline before 5 o'clock. Sometimes certified delivery means, and I've done this before, from PA, I'm heading to D.C. Because <laughs> like, the grant gets done like Monday morning at 10, it's due at 5. FedEx ain't going to help you. You're going to hand deliver the damn thing. Okay. Now, you get the grant, throw a party. You know, if you don't toot your own horn, who's going to toot it for you? You know, you got to tell people about it. You want to make a splash, make some news. Let other people know that you are successful because maybe they'll give you money too, right? Invite the press. And then good luck on your next project because as soon as you get the one grant, in addition to working on it and accomplishing the goals and objectives, you should be thinking about where the next one's coming from, okay? Because that one's going to run out of money sooner or later. Thank them. I always thank people. Thank you for giving me a half million dollars. You're wonderful. I love you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I don't say that, you know, but I do think it, though. I mean, I love GOCCP. They are wonderful for our program at the college. Failure, ugh. I always start off with this. How many people applied? That would make me feel better to know that, you know, 500 people applied and you only gave 10 awards. You don't feel too bad. Now, if you find out that 11 people applied and 10 award got awarded, <laughs> <laughs> then you're like, I'm in trouble. How close did you get? You know, so sometimes with these USDA grants, you know, well, the cutoff was 282 points and you had 283 or 280, you know, you missed it by just a little bit. You don't feel quite so bad. But if it was 282 and you only got 20, you know, kind of want to reboot that. Always get the reviewer comments if you fail because you'll need those when you resubmit. And guess what? I thank them when I get the grant. I thank them when I don't. So I just don't thank them maybe as much. Try again next year. Don't give up. So that's it for that. I'd be happy to take a couple questions if you have any. What was our homework? Our homework, <laughs> our homework assignment. Bonnie, you want to talk about that real briefly? I can give you the mic here. Oh, you have a good, good. I'm going to turn mine off then. So 
have you all used Canvas before? Yes. No? OK. Well, Sam's going to give a quick overview of Canvas. The assignment is already up there. It's due in a week so that you have a week, or I have a week, rather, to review it and get it back to you with comments so you can then build on it in our next session. The assignments can also be submitted on Canvas, so Sam will go over that as well. In addition, if uh, this week's assignment is pretty basic. It's just getting you to start thinking about your idea um, and a potential funding source. So it's it'll probably be very quick for you to do. If you need help with ideas, please give me an email or um, a call. I work with a lot of nonprofits. We have one here represented at Crossroads, which if you need an idea of a funding target, uh, Crossroads is a great organization that provides services to kids and adults with mental health issues. I work at Kent Center, where we provide services to adults with developmental disabilities. I also work with a lot of other nonprofits. So if you really want to go the nonprofit angle, feel free to see me after class, and I'll hook you up with someone that can help you. Otherwise, I know Stu would love for you all to bring in money for your program as well. So um, assignment will be due in a week. Typically, you have an assignment due every Thursday that we do not have a class and they build off on the, of the previous as well as the lectures. The goal is at the end of this, you will have a completed proposal to submit. You will also have a binder of one in-depth um, funder research that you can then use as a model for what you do with others. Um, it might not be as big as some of the binders I have where mine are like this big. I keep everything in. You'll reports from funders, everything. Uh, but you'll start. It's a starting place. It's something that you are going to continue to do. It's also a <coughs> skill you're going to be able to use, not just for grants writing, but if you get into advocacy or any kind of sales, you'll be able to use a skill there. So um, just keep whatever you're doing together, and it'll go across many boundaries.